All right, so let's talk about the file system in the Onion and the way we deal with reading and writing files. Uh, to begin with, you would think that this is something quite simple. All we want to do is like read some files from disk and write some files, and maybe index some directories. And we have OS functions to do that. So you would think that the file system is just some wrapper about around a few OS functions. Uh, but it turns out that there, there are more things that we kind of want to do with files. So in addition from reading from disk, we also probably want to be able to read or write to memory instead because we might not always want to flush our files out to disk. We might want to have stuff in memory and still be able to use the same kind of interface to access them. Um, we also have uh, when we want to release a final game, we probably want to put all the files in in a pack or a zip file. We call we call those files bundles in the Stingray Onion. So you want to bundle everything, and then you want to be able to read from that zipped bundle instead of reading directly loose files from disk. So the interface must work in that scenario too. Uh, then we have this thing that I talked about uh, in one of the previous talks that when we when we want to run a game on, on console, when, when we do test runs on console or test runs on iOS, we don't want to deploy all the data to that device because that can take a lot of time just copying thousands of files to, to a remote device. So instead, we stream the data uh, over the network. Uh, well, that means, of course, that our file system too needs to work in that case. It needs to be uh, transparent about whether we're reading data from local disk or if we're reading data from over the network. Uh, then there is also asynchronous reading. If we're uh, streaming data, for example, streaming streaming um, a song that's being played or some other kind of streaming, uh, we don't want we don't want stalls from that uh, from loading that data to interrupt our main thread. Uh, so we need to be able to read read stuff in the in the background somehow and we also want to prevent uh, prevent disk seeks and as we, we will see uh, later in this and um, in this talk there's actually more subtlety to doing that than than you might think so preventing disk seeks the, the main the main reason here is that uh, whenever whenever you seek on a hard drive uh, the read head has to move, and that's, since that's like a physical operation, it, it can take things, it can take at times like 100 milliseconds, which is a really long time in, in, uh, in the computer world. Uh, of course, as we're moving to SSDs, this is less of an issue, but it's still true with, with SSDs and, and even, even, with, uh, even with regular memory that doing sequential reads always tends to be faster than doing doing random access so and if you actually measure it on an SSD it kind of still makes sense to 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 minimize your disk seize, even, even though the problem is a lot smaller of course in the case of SSDs than, than it is with with uh, hard drives with a physical drive head so there you would think that file systems is like oh it's pretty simple but then when you start adding all of this stuff it tends to get uh, complicated and uh, sort of ex exacerbating this issue is that in, in BitSquid and in Stingray, we've sort of added these additional features to the file system over time. We've added more and more stuff and that has sort of made it kind of messy uh, rather than if we had designed everything to have all these features from the beginning. So it's a bit, it's a bit more complicated than it perhaps should be, but we'll go through it now and something that we maybe can refactor in the future. So the basic class we have is, uh, the basic classes we have are in the file system.h file. And uh, that file mainly consists of interfaces for, for abstracting over the file system. Uh, so we have a lot of virtual pure abstract classes that just represent our interfaces for dealing with file systems or file system like things like memory containers that pretend to be file systems. Um, so uh, there's actually a hierarchy here. 
uh, that I'll go through. The, the base class of the hierarchy is this I file system, which represents a read-only file system because some of our systems are are read-only, so it makes sense to have that abstracted out. And it contains things like uh, getting the entries in a directory, checking if a file exists, uh, checking the size, uh, hashing it. We actually have that as a special operation because because some of our some of our file systems have ways of doing this more fast than by reading the file and, and hashing it, and it's a useful operation. So we we have that as a as a base operation in the interface, um, opening it and so on. Uh, then we have uh, the next more specialized class, which is the writable file system, which rep represents a file system that can actually be changed. So here you can create directories, you can remove files, rename files, and write files. And then we have our implementation of this writable file system interface, which is a class just called file system. All this naming is a bit, yeah, maybe this class should be called disk file system or real file system or, or something. But this anyway represents a file system that is actually on your disk or a file system that you can read using your regular system IO routines. So you construct that with a class that takes the root of your file system so we can create sort of sub-file systems that exist at a certain path. Uh, or you can create it in a way that you use the file client so then all the operations will happen over uh, over the network. Um, yeah, so those are the basic classes, and then there's also a bunch of utility functions. Um, kind of in the same way as we did with the string class, we prefer to put these utility systems outside of the class and just make sure that the class have all the op all just the basic operations that we need, and whenever we need to extend it with uh, more more stuff stuff that can be written upon that basic uh, interface. We put it outside of the class to reduce the coupling and sort of make uh, make things less complicated. And, and this also means that you don't have to worry about, oh, has make tree been overridden in, in some file system? No, it's, it's always the same implementation. It just uses the interface of the file system. So here are some like utility things like copying files and making a whole tree of directories so you can ensure that a certain path exists and stuff like that. And also recursively recursively enumerating the file system so not just a single directory but an entire directory tree. Uh, so it's useful stuff. Um, so the, the file client uh, when we when we go through the network that's actually implemented inside um, the disk file system, which is, I would say it's, it's counterintuitive. Uh, it's, it's legacy code, that's the way we've decided to do it. It'd probably be better to have something that clearer represented something different than a file system that represented a, a network file system, or something like that, but something to be refactored in the future. Right now it's implemented like this. So in this file system class, which represents a file system on disk, there's flag use file client that, that specifies whether these operations should actually use a file client or not. As you can see, not all of the operations are supported by the file client, which is a bit messy too. But for the ones that are, we check this flag. If we should use a file client, we will uh, defer this operation to the file client interface and, and check it uh, call exists on the fly client, and if it's not, we'll, uh, we'll go through the local OS functions and call the local OS functions to find out if a file exists. This is just a function for abstracting, like a very thin abstraction over, over the different OSs that we support. So we just call out to uh, the file exists function for, for our particular OS. And there's all these, these interfaces. Yeah, there's a uh, uh, a namespace here is for, for the platform interface. So these are the sort of low-level wrappers over, over the raw OS interface. So yeah, if you design this from the ground up, you would probably not have that switch flag in file system CPP to call out to, to the file client. Um, 
so this is the basic, the disk file system, uh, but there are some other, other file system things that also inherit this interface. So the most important one is what we call the database. And uh, the database is kind of a virtual file system. Uh, so it, it acts as a file system in that it associates content to specific paths. Um, but it's not necessarily represented by, by an actual file system. So, um, and the database is actually what we use to represent our, our source data folder. Uh, we represent that with database that, that represents it. So the database kind of looks like the file system, but not exactly. It has, it knows a number of paths and for each path, it has some content associated with that path. Uh, so you can check the size of that content. You can say, check if a path exists. Uh, you can read that content. You can write it, uh, remove it, and so on. Uh, as you can see, this the database doesn't implement the file system interface because it's kind of a different thing. So, but it has an adapter, so uh, you can create a file system from this database. And then you get a file system that you can use as a normal file system. And the database supports, uh, we have multiple types of database. You can, we can create a memory database, which means that all of this resides in memory. So we, we basically just have a, uh, a map in memory that says on this path, and uh, this content exists on this path, this content exists on this path and this content ex exists. So since we have, since we have support for a memory based database and we can create a file system interface for that, we can sort of create a pretend file system entirely in memory. So if you want to do some, uh, if you want to test some algorithm and that algorithm takes files as input and writes file contents, uh, that could be kind of tricky. But since we have this way of representing an entire file system in memory, we can just create a memory database, uh, put whatever input files we want in that, uh, create an interface, file system interface for it, and call out to the code that manipulates files, and then we can check the result uh, when we get it back. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Uh, we can also create a disk-based uh, database. All of these creation functions are here in in uh, in the database h file so we can call memory database to create the memory database disk database to create the database that represents a disk at a specific root and uh, this database will actually do what i said before it will what i talked about before it will it will hash it will hash files sort of in the background so it knows the hash of all files and can answer questions about the hash uh, of files uh, really quickly which is neat because then it, we have a neat way of detecting when files change. Um, there's also a mount based version of the database and uh, that's called uh, a mount database, uh, which you make with this function. And what, what the mount database is, it's a database that mounts other databases at certain paths. So what this means is that you can create a database uh, that represents the disk and uh, like a certain folder of the disk. Then you can mount a folder from somewhere else on the disk onto a path in this database. Uh, so we use this quite a lot. For example, we have the core folder, which is usually shared by all our projects. And we do that by mounting Instead of copying the core folder into every project, which would create issues if the core folder is changed in the future, and it's also unnecessary, we just mount the core folder into the path core uh, of the source project whenever you want to compile it. And plugins use this a lot. If a plugin needs some, some custom data, uh, so the plugin is, is not just code, uh, but it also needs some data representation, the plugin can actually mount that data into a specific path. Uh, in, into the user's project, and then uh, the plugin knows that, that that data is always there. Um, this this 
this mount database also also implements sort of a, a memory overlay of the data. So when you when you write stuff to the mount database, uh, you the stuff you write is kept in in memory. It's not written to disk until you actually call the save function. So that means that the mount database can sort of hold a temporary state uh, of files. So the idea behind this is that if you work in the editor and you make some temporary changes to one of your resource files, but you don't want to save that data because uh, the user should be in control of when the data is saved, uh, you can still you can still write that data to the mount database, but write it into the memory portion, uh, which means that when we later compile from this database, we will compile with that, with that sort of transactional temporary state of the resource and you will get a, a compile result where you see uh, what the result would look like if you had saved this data uh, and then you can decide or so you can get a preview from within the engine of what everything looks like uh, with this transitioner data and then you can decide to save it or not so this is this database is, is actually what what is the basis for for the project what we call the asset server, uh, which is which is uh, having a server in the engine that allows you to read and write source files, and re also read and write them in this temporary in memory state uh, that I talked about. So you can temporarily write something, compile with that, and see what it what it looks like without having to save it to disk. Uh, and this is what I'll talk more about this in one some future talk, go into a bit a, li a bit more detail about how this works since it's an important system and the plan for how we plan to build our editors in the future. Uh, but this just gives some background on how it connects to the other parts of the file system. Uh, we have, there's another special file system and it's called the file system cache, which is kind of simple. Uh, but this, all this, all this file system does is that it it buffers writes to, uh, so it's, I can show it, it's a, it's a writable file system and it, it has the interface of the writable file system and also the uh, possibility of flushing, uh, flushing writes to disk. So what it does is that whenever you write something to this file system cache, it's not written directly to disk, it's kept in memory and and then we sort of have a background process that writes all these files out to disk and the main purpose of this is that it it allows a compile to complete before we've done uh, all the disk operations and as you will see when when i talk about the data compiler which i will do in a future talk we spend we we spend quite a lot of effort in making sure that we can do really fast incremental compiles uh, like below 100 milliseconds, we should be able to turn a compiler around. And an important part of that is not writing to disk more than we have to, because disk is always kind of slow. It's faster now when we have SSDs, but it's still slow compared to memory. So uh, having this buffered system allows allows us allows our compile to complete before uh, the disk write is complete. And this is, this is shared with the file server, this object, which means that the file server will actually serve from this cache instead of serving, serving directly from disk. So the file server can start serving out the, the compiled project before it has been written to disk. So we can load it into a run in engine and see the result of our compile before we have uh, committed everything to disk, uh, which is kind of nice. So that sort of covers the the file system classes representing file systems. Then we have the classes that we that we actually use to uh, access the files, and those are kind of divided. The system we have for accessing the files is kind of divided into two different classes. Uh, one class which we call the buffer, uh, and another class which we call the archive. So. Uh, which have slightly different purposes. So the purpose of the buffer is just to represent a chunk of data uh, from a file or from a file, a memory, a file that exists only in memory and so on. Uh, 
And the reason for the buffer to exist is that we don't want to read, whenever we read, we don't want to read uh, data byte by byte from a file. Uh, we want to be able to read sort of bigger chunks and then process it byte by byte since to reduce the number of system calls we make. Um, so the input buffer is kind of simple. Um, it just has some data in it. Um, it has a buffer with data and it has a position pointer that point knows where in the buffer we are dealing with that data. And then it has functions for uh, setting the position. Uh, uh, I'll see. It has functions function we can get the total size of the data. We can get how much data we can read right now. That's how much data that's available in this small buffer that we have in this class. So that's how much data we can read without bringing in more data from, from disk or whatever backing source we have. Uh, and then when we have a consume function that we use to specify that we've used a certain amount of data of this buffer, so this sort of moves the read head in the buffer. And then there's the, the flush function that is used to actually bring in more data from, from our backing buffer. So whenever we run out of stuff in our local buffer, which we can access, the local buffer is just a pointer, uh, so we can access that directly as raw memory, which is super fast, but whenever we run out of memory there, we need to flush and get more, more data back from the disk. And this input buffer is actually a base class. We have different subclasses of that, uh, which and the subclasses are kind of similar, but they implement, implement this flushing function differently because they, they get the, the data from different sources. Uh, we have the memory input buffer, which is really simply because all the data is in memory. So the input buffer can just point to the entire chunk of data from the start it doesn't really need to flush anything because the data is already in a continuous memory chunk. Um, then we have the file input buffer, which is used to deal with actual uh, files on disk, uh, which needs to uh, talk to the disk to bring in more data. And the file input buffer can run in two modes. It can run synchronously, which means that it will stall uh, whenever it needs to fill uh, fill the buffer with data, uh, which means it will stall the th thread. And if your if the thread is your your main thread or one of your main threads, the the engine will sort of stall and chug, so you don't want that. Uh, but then it can also run in asynchronous mode, which means it will attempts to fill the buffer uh, in the background. So the way the way this works is. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, we, we check if we're, uh, if we're in the, uh, if we're in the asynchronous mode, then we'll actually start to fill, we'll start to fill the buffer uh, asynchronously. Let's see. Can we do this? Yeah. So if we're if we're in synchronous mode, we reserve. Normally, we reserve. We have a variable called the read chunk, which which is the amount of data we bring in in one go. So that's the size of the buffer we flush into flush into memory with one request. And if we're in a synchronous mode, we allocate two of those so that we can, when one is consumed, we start to fill the next one in the, ba in the background. So by, well, if, if we're in synchronous mode, we only need one of them because we will stall, whenever it's exhausted, we will stall and refill it. So, uh, so if we're in asynchronous mode, we, we read that other buffer in the background. While it's in synch synchronous mode, we'll read, wait for the read to finish, and then update our buffer. So that's something that's useful to know that this file input buffer sort of runs in two different modes, uh, uh, depending on that flag. So that's the buffer. Then we have the class called 
input archive, which is what you use to to read from uh, to read from files. So the archive takes a buffer. It's created with a buffer, uh, uh, and it, it actually uses a shared input buffer. So you can create multiple archives from the same buffer, and they will they will share the pointer, and they will free it when you. So you can copy archives too. You can uh, copy the archive freely using a copy constructor. And this input buffer will be freed when all the archives that refer to it have been have been released. So the archive the, car, the archive sort of wraps the input buffer and provides like normal uh, read and, and get character functions and position and kind of what you would expect from your regular file class. We call it input archive, but it's kind of a kind of a file class. Uh, and it does all the necessary flushing and so of the input buffer in the background. Uh, but it actually exposes the buffer too. So if, if you if you need to like take take more detailed control of the buffer because you want to read larger chunks, for instance, for some special applications, you can do that. So this has all normal file reading stuff, and then it has super weird stuff: remember, pointer, refer, recall, uh, which shouldn't really be here. This is actually used by our old serialization system, and I'll talk to that. Uh, talk to that. Talk about that in a while. But this is a big code smell in my mind. This shouldn't be. This shouldn't be here in the input archive. Doesn't really belong here. Uh, right. So yeah, this is. We don't use shared pointers that much in the onion. But this is pretty much the only place where we use a shared pointer, uh, so that we can. Co copy the archives around. Uh, the output system, I won't go through that because it's very similar to the input system. We have an output buffer .h, we have file output buffer, memory output buffer, we have an output archive and it all follows the same pattern as the input buffer. So you can go look at that on your own. So then to complicate things even further, as I said, there are a lot of parts to this system. It's more complicate, uh, complicated than you might expect. Uh, we have something called a file queue. And the file queue exists for one reason only. It's to prevent disk stalls. As I said, whenever we screen things, we don't want the disk to stall. So, and we don't want to spawn like, like in, in a lot of, in a lot of applications when you want to, prevent stores, you spawn like separate threads to do, uh, oh, I spawn, I need to read a file, let's spawn a separate thread to do it, and now I need to stream another file, spawn another thread. And then you have like 100 threads running, which means you get lots of uh, content switches potentially, and issues like that. We don't really want to do that. We try not to oversubscribe uh, the threads in the onion. So we try to do stuff with asynchronous reads rather than having having threads everywhere. Uh, so we don't want to use that, uh, but we still want to prevent disk stalls. So you might ask, why do we even need this? As you, as you saw in the, uh, in the code for the file input archive, we actually had an asynchronous flag and we had support for asynchronous reading in the file input archive. So we could, you could ask yourself, isn't this enough? Isn't this enough that we have this asynchronous read in the file input archive? Well, it turns out it really isn't. There are still sources of stalls. Uh, one stall is that uh, just opening a file may, may actually stall because uh, that apparently needs to go down into the disk layer, find that file, look at some stuff, look at some flags on the disk perhaps. So, so this will actually stall, stall your application. So we need to deal with that. And we need to queue our, our opens. Um, there another issue, which is even more subtle and, and one that we didn't know about from the start, but we sort of find out, is that some OSS will split and reorder file reads between the threads. So um, you might have a situation where you have two threads, A and B, and they're both streaming data. And when you're streaming data, you want to read 
like kind of large chunks of data because you want to avoid, as I said before, you want to avoid disk seeks. They're pretty expensive. And a disk seek can be as expensive as reading like one megabyte of data. So if you just if you if you seek to read just 8k of data, that means you're spending this much much time seeking and this much time actually reading the data. So you're just seeking all the time. So you should spend at least much as much time reading data as as you're spending time seeking. So, so you're actually doing something useful with the disk. Uh, so that should sort of guide the, the size of the chunks that you uh, that you read from the disk when you're streaming. Uh, so you might think that everything is okay because thread A here reads a big chunk chunk of data, one megabyte, and then thread uh, thread B comes in and issues a file read operation and says, "I want one megabyte of data." Oh, it looks cool. Thread A reads one megabyte. Thread B reads one megabyte. Should be good. But it turns out the OS can split and reorder these reads. So the OS will, uh, unbeknownst to us, split this one megabyte read into 16, 64K reads maybe, and split that, this one into 16, 64K reads, and then interleave those reads. So we read 64K here, jump to another part of the disk, read 64K there, jump back to the first part, read 64K there, So which means we're seeking back and forth, back and forth between the places where these two threads read and totally thrashing the, the performance of the hard drive. Uh, so in order to get, in order to fix this, we, since the, we need to do what we thought the OS would be doing, we need to sort of uh, implement that part. So we need to make sure that we have a single queue for all the disk reads so that when thread A says one, it wants to read one megabyte and, and then thread B says it, we make sure that all these reads, all the thread A reads, are finished before we start doing the thread B reads, so that we kind of get the, the seeking behavior that we want. So there's a class file queue uh, that does this, um, that reads, basically it takes all these uh, operations that can stall and that we want to make sure that they are ordered, like opening a file, like reading data, and it puts them on a big queue, and then you can query the queue for when the result is done. Uh, so that deals with that. So how do you use this if you want to if you want to stream if you want to stream data without stalling? Well we have something called a future input archive. This is this is yes this is basically just an interface to the to the file queue system. You create a future input archive of the file you want to read, and then you you wait. Uh, you check each each uh, frame of your application. You check uh, to see if this uh, if this future input archive has become ready, which means that the open operation on the file queue background thread has completed. And when that has happened, you can get the real the real input archive from this future input archive and then you can uh, uh, use the asynchronous read interface in that and it will that will go through the file queue and everything will work. Uh, you can con control the size of this read chunk uh, to sort of control the size of the packages you want to read in based on like your how much memory you want to use and your uh, disk performance and so on. And there's also a function in, in uh, the input buffers you, where you can check if you can flush without stalling, which means that you can, uh, so you can know up ahead if, if, if what you're streaming, if you can get more data from it without having to go back to disk and fetch it. And in that case, you can sort of take a decision. Should you stall your thread in order to wait for that uh, data to get in, or should you proceed without the data, and for example, stall uh, the playback of the sound so you will get the stutter in the sound instead of get a stutter in your entire application you can sort of take the right decision so i i would say that looking at all this the system is kind of complicated there are a lot of different classes sort of interacting here and a lot of different moving parts and i think i think you could do some refactoring to make this whole thing nicer for example it would be I mean, instead of dealing with these future input archives and setting read, uh, setting the size of this read chunks and so on, it might be better 
it might be better if the systems that uh, that wanted to do uh, asynchronous streaming could just talk to the file queue directly. Uh, but that doesn't work right now because the file queue doesn't redirect to the file client. So if we did that, it wouldn't work when we're running in network mode because that redirection happens in the file system, as we saw. So uh, I think you could probably do some refactoring uh, of these classes to get all the behavior that we want, but but the simpler, simpler code, code base. It would be would be a nice thing to do, but there's a bit of work in order to do it. Uh, final thing I want to talk about um, serialization and the file server. So uh, we have our new serialization system. That's kind of the, the one that we think you should use for everything whenever you write new code. That's sort of completely independent of the of the I.O. system. I'm just mentioning it here because it's kind of related. So with a new system, you just generate a blob of binary data. Uh, typically, typically, you use uh, the clauses in this uh, header that, that's called stream. Basically, that's just functions for, for packing data onto a character. So it takes arbitrary data and you just pack it uh, into a single uh, char buffer. Uh, and you generate this big blob and then you write it directly to disk and then you can read it back directly into memory and use it directly and use offsets to refer to stuff so you don't need any pointer patching and so on and and this uh, this pack function yeah that's just that's just it so it's a pr pretty simple system now we still have stuff that uses the old serialization system the old serialization system, it's based on the input archives. Uh, so this you shouldn't use this, uh, but I'll go through it just so you know it when you see it. The old serialization system is based on a templated function called serialize that you put in the classes that you want to be able to serialize. And this is actually a single function. So we use the same function for serializing data in and serializing data out. So this function both reads and writes data. And the way that works is that it's it's templated on this stream class, which represents either an input archive or an output archive. So when it's an input archive, we will read the data, and when it's an output archive, we will write the data. Uh, so it's kind of a neat way, I thought at the time, that it's kind of a neat way to avoid having to write two functions that does the same thing but it's much nicer to use a new serialization system. But for, for what it does, it's, I, guess it's, I guess it's good. It uses this uh, operator uh, for serializing data. So this operator either reads or writes depending on, on what, what the class of, of S is here. And then uh, it has to do things like pointer patching. For example, we, we support serializing an array but the array has a pointer to its data, which means that we need to we need to serialize the pointer in and out. We need to, when we write, save these pointers to convert them to some magic ID value that we can convert back when we load it on. And this is actually why you saw we had these all these ugly functions in the input archive for like remembering pointers and referring pointers. That's for for doing the pointer serialization uh, as a part of. Uh, as part of this uh, deserialization code, so we can look, we can see what it looks like in in one example. Uh, the unit resource is is a resource that still uses this system, and the main reason for that is that the unit resource is kind of big and it has a lot of a lot of things that it serializes, which makes it kind of a pain to rewrite it to the new system. So it. Uh, so it has special clauses. I won't go into this the pointer serialization because this whole system is stupid. But anyway, it has special clauses for handling uh, pointer serialization and deserialization, and then it just serializes all the different things that that exists in this uh, unit here. So as I said, this this whole system is ugly and complicated. There's too much magic. There's too many templates. It's really slow uh, compared to the new serialization system where you just get stuff into memory and can use it. 
we should replace this with just using binary blobs uh, everywhere in the code, and then we can get rid of all these serialization functions, get rid of these weird, weird uh, methods in the input archive and so on. Um, so kind of a big refactor, kind of a several places where this is used, and it's somewhere. It's not hard, but it's a bit of work to do that. Uh, so finally, I wanted to say something about how the file client and the file server works. Um, the file server, as I said earlier, when I talked about the console server, it listens to the WebSocket at a specific address. Uh, when it gets a connection from a client, it detaches this WebSocket and spawns a custom thread to deal with that connection, just so that we can serve files as fast as possible. And we use a binary protocol over this WebSocket, again, in order to be, to be fast. It actually makes a bit of a difference. And it, it gets commands from the client, things like, all the commands are like the, the regular file operations. We turn them into WebSocket commands, send them over this connection, and send the replies back to, uh, to the client. So there's things like connect, open, read, to read some data from a file, and so on. Um, it's, I kind of, I kind of would like to, kind of would like the file client to get as fast as reading from regular disk. I think it should be possible because disks are slow and networks are kind of fast. So it should be theoretically possible to stream data over the file client at about the same speed as reading from a local disk or uh, it's still, I did some measurements and I did some optimizations and some measurements on this and it's still like 50% slower or something like that. Uh, but I would like to return to that and, and do some more optimizations and try to see if we can get it as fast as local disk. Because then we can always run through the file server, which means we can use this nice file system cache, cache thing always. So we, we always read the data from the file system cache and we will always get data in memory, and we can do sort of recompiles, um, interactive recompiles without ever touching disk, and all those kinds of things would be really nice. But there's some optimization work to be to be done there to, to get to that speed. Um, there's some security here to prevent us from just sharing, uh, sharing your data on disk with everybody in the world. Uh, so there's a secret you need to provide uh, when you're either starting a file server or connecting to it. And these secrets must match or we won't allow the connection. And we also only serve directories which have uh, a special marker file in them called Stingrid Asset Server Directory uh, to make sure you don't share something that you don't want to share on your disk drive. So that's the file system. Any questions on that? Yeah, th thanks a lot, Niklas. Um, do you, is there some kind of pattern or utility to serialize an array of structure using the stream, the new system? Yeah, so, I mean, usually you just, you just write, you just write, um, you just write each, you can, you can just pack each struct to the stream using this strap. You can look at, for instance, you can look at this function, for instance, uh, font serialization is kind of a simple serialization. Um, it has a struct for representing glyphs in the font. And when we do the compile here, we just loop over all the, all the glyphs we have. We create the struct based on, based on fields in the JSON file. And then we pack each struct. So this just packs each of them onto that, that binary blob. And when you read that, you know, at runtime, uh... Do you, what do you get? You get an array of glyphs or something We, like we, that? we never read that. We just, we just use the data directly. So, so at runtime, uh, when we need to, uh, at runtime, we just have a pointer to this data in memory. Uh, so there's usually uh, some header. Yeah, this is the header that we pack first into this file. Uh, so when we want to, if we want to look up a glyph, we just take the pointer to the resource. Uh, we step past this, this, this header. So we just do memory address uh, manipulation. So you have to add the okay, size. So yeah. 
So at runtime, you 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 have some helper that help you from a pointer to get a proper address, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's usually there's usually some some lookup that's let's see if I can find it here. Uh, Yeah, this is it. <laughs> it's not very complicated. It it takes so this is kind of a this kind of a trick. It takes uh, the font resource here. Uh, this struct is actually just the header of it, and then it's followed by glyphs. So by adding one to the address of this header, we're we're getting the address just where the header ends, and that's the start of our glyph array. So this is all we, all we do to access the array of the array of the glyphs. Okay, thanks. All Tom, right. I have another question, maybe. Um, if we go back to, to Mount databases and uh, file systems, um, I'm not sure if it's really relevant or if I misunderstood something about um, it. seems that we, we, we use some kind of cache um, or the, the Moon database is, is used to have some kind of override in memory of, of, yes. of stuff that are not committed to disk, but we still want to hide them like another version, right? Um, but so so, uh, but in the in the other end, do you have do we have something that uh, when it reads uh, from memory uh, keeps it in? Well, sorry, it's from from disk keeps it in memory uh, for in, as a cache. You know, uh, let's say I want to use a fifth, uh, five hundred megabytes of uh, memory. Yeah, no, we don't do that, and that is something that could be. I've thought about that, and that is something we probably want to add to the database at some point. That it actually right now, it right now, if you use like the disk based. Uh, variety of this it will always go to disk to read the data but there are like if you're iterating over the same few files the whole time there might be situations where you would want to to keep that memory keep that keep that data in memory rather than going back to the disk all time to fetch it but it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky problem to write the, the strategy for that like when do you keep it in memory when do you when do you throw it away but but you could have some some cache for that, um, like a fixed size cache. Like the, we keep the most recent files around in memory because someone might want to read them again soon. So I, I think something like that could be interesting. Okay, thanks. All right, let's let's take a, like three minute break and then we'll do the next one. I think that one is kind of short, so I I don't think we'll be too late. Okay, see you in three minutes. <laughs>